Well, it's no secret that we all have routines in our daily lives. But did you realize or did you know that 50% of your day, 50% of your day is routine? 50% of your day, you don't have to think about really what you're doing. Think about how you get ready in the morning. You get dressed and have breakfast and head off to work. You probably don't even think about what you're doing. You're probably thinking about a hundred other things that you need to get done or want to do. And you're not thinking about brushing your teeth or combing your hair or having your morning coffee. And, and before you know it, that routine is done. Until you realize, like you did, like I did this morning, that I forgot to put my belt on. So routine that, you know, I grew up in a house where if you don't have your belt on, you're not dressed. They didn't, like, my, that was my, my dad was like, if you don't have a belt on, you're not, you're not ready to go. Well, dad, I didn't wear it this morning. It feels a little weird. Anyway, uh, there are a lot of health benefits to having routine, right? And, and we all know that having a healthy breakfast and exercising and making good decisions about when we go to sleep and getting enough sleep are all really good routines to have. But we equally can have negative routines, like grabbing that bag of potato chips and sitting down and binging hours of Netflix, and then we stay up a little too late, and we get up a little too late the next day, and we figure out we're tired, and all of a sudden that thing that we did once becomes a routine. And we have positive and negative impacts because of the routines that we have on our life. And changing those routines take a conscious effort. It takes time. It takes weeks, even months, to change our routines. Well, the Apostle Paul in his letter is writing to the early church in Colossae as we finish our, our series through Colossians today. And he has his routine. I mean, Paul wrote a lot of letters. A lot of them in, are in the Bible. And he has a routine, a format that he follows. He has his opening, his greeting, his praying for people, his giving thanks for them. And he has his closing, which we'll look at a little bit uh, in a few mo moments. And he has the way that he does it. But in each of his letters, his opening and his closing are quite unique. Even though they're formatted in what seems to be routine, he has a unique way of bringing that home to that unique church or group of people in Colossae. He mentions his fellow workers and his final instructions, which we're going to read in chapter 4, verses 2 to 9 this morning. Let's read them together. Paul writes these words, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may, we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace seasoned with salt, so that you may know him, know who to answer, how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all about the news about me, and he, will, and he is a dear brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. And I am sending him to you to express the purpose that you have, and that you may know about our circumstances, and that he may encourage your hearts he is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother who is one of you. And they will tell you everything that is happening here. If we don't have to think about half of our day, if we go through the motions and don't consider why we do what we do, how we do them, or should we even be doing them? It's easily just to go through the motions of each and every day. I was thinking about this as I was standing in line at the grocery store on July 2nd. 
Uh, July 1st is Canada Day, and there was celebrations and fireworks, and, and uh, I mentioned to the cashier that I really enjoyed the fireworks that were out on the barge on Okanagan Lake, and it was a great evening, and, and I expected that she would reiterate that, that it was a great evening, the fireworks were really good, and, and she said, well, they messed up my routine. I didn't like the people that were celebrating in the apartment building. I certainly didn't like the fireworks because they woke me up because they were loud, because I had to get up at work at 4.30 in, in the morning. And, and I sympathized with her that, oh, 4.30 is early to get up. And, and I paid for my groceries and grabbed them and, and headed off. And she started to scan the items for the next customer, and she started right in again on how tired she was and how much she didn't like July 1st and the fireworks. And, and I thought, I wonder how many times she's going to have that conversation with every customer that comes through that day and how she's probably not even thinking about what she's saying until she gets home at night and she thinks, oh, what, what did I say today to customers? How did I act and respond to the conversations? And I wonder, for some of us, sometimes we get so in the routine of everyday life that we say, well, yeah, everything is fine. How are you? I'm fine. How are things going? Um, we're good. And we don't really even consider that what we're saying or how we're answering because it just becomes so routine that we forget that we should be, you know, thinking about what we're saying and how we're responding and what kinds of questions we're asking people. And I was just taken back by how disappointed she was about the fireworks because I really enjoyed them, other than the fact that you had to figure out how to get out of downtown after the fireworks. And that took, that took almost an hour by the time we got to the car, dropped some kids off and got home. But the fireworks were great. Um, so, but think about our routine. Now, Paul has opened his letter very routinely. He encourages people. He's praying for people. He was encouraging this young group of believers in Colossae. And he closes his letter by asking them to pray for him and his colleagues. To build into their routine, their everyday lives, thoughtful prayer for his ministry and for what he's doing and even probably for his own personal situation. Remember, Paul is in prison. He's been there for a while. He's never met the church that's in Colossae. And when I say church, it's probably a house church of about a dozen people. And Paul has never met these people, but he writes this letter to encourage them, to give them some instructions, and to pray for them. And he, in return, says, pray for me. Not just about his personal situation, about being in jail, but about the ministry that God has called him to and the ministry that his colleagues continue on uh, without him. That they would be responsible and aware of sharing the good news at every opportunity that they have. No matter his location, whether he's in jail or a free man, whether he's beaten or shipwrecked, whatever the circumstances is that his language, his speaking, his letter writing, his stories would be foremost about Jesus. Now, by the time we get to Paul in his letter to the Colossae church, he's about halfway through his traveling career, his ministry career. And so he's been halfway around the Mediterranean world. He has planted churches. He has seen people come to faith. He has seen God work in miraculous ways. He's written multiple letters. But Paul never takes any of this for granted. He doesn't take it for granted. He wants to make sure that every opportunity he has, he will share the gospel with people. That his work is relying on God at work through his letters and his words and his everyday actions. None of this we could say none of this is routine for Paul. Though it may seem like it is for us, 
His opening and closing remarks and his letter are very familiar to us because they're, they're in multiple letters of his, but it's not routine for Paul. It's a bit unique in every situation. And he wants to, us and he wants the early church to think about what you're doing, how you're talking, what your actions are, how you're connecting with people, and ultimately how grateful we are for being part of God's work. Throughout Colossians, Paul has said multiple times that he is thankful for what God is doing, and that God is allowing him to be a part of his work. So Paul sincerely asked this young church of new believers to pray for him and the work that he's up to. Now, Paul's a veteran in the faith, and maybe it's kind of like, you know, as a parent, you often want your kids to grow up to be adults, and, and I would mean that they know how to do things as an adult, right? So when they move out of the house, they can do their own laundry, cook for themselves, and so you ask your kids, uh, can you empty the dishwasher, do the laundry, or fold the clothes, right? Whatever it is. And you know that you could probably do it way faster and better, right? Like you can. There's no question. Or take out the garbage. None of these are, are extremely hard jobs. But they're important jobs because we do them every day. We do them all the time. We, they're routine. We don't even think about them. You probably have a certain way you like to load the dishwasher or do the laundry or how you like to tie the bag when you take it out to the garbage. I do. I have those things. I like to do it my way. And the only way I can tell my kids is to show them. I could tell them, but it's far better to show them. This is how you load the dishwasher. This is how you do your laundry. This is how you take out the garbage and tie it properly. Whatever it is. Now you know, as well as I do, that these things take time. But the hope is that over years, that routine of loading the dishwasher, doing the laundry, folding the laundry, taking out the garbage, would be routine. That you don't even have to think about it. You don't think about loading the dishwasher or where you put your coffee cup when you're done in the morning. It goes in the dishwasher. You didn't even think about it. It doesn't go on the counter, George. Uh, it, goes, it goes in the dishwasher. There's a proper way to fold the towels. There's a proper way to take the garbage out. The point is, the point is not about doing all those chores. The point is that Paul is asking the early church, these young believers, to pray for him, to pray for his colleagues and the ministry that they're up to. Now, Paul's a seasoned veteran. Sometimes it's easier just to do it ourselves, isn't it? And I wonder if Paul would have been like, well, it's easier, not that he would just pray for himself, but it's easier to do it myself. And Paul is saying, no, this is a part of growing up, of being mature in the faith. That the more times we do things like praying, whether it's in front of people or in a small group or on our own or in silence, it becomes routine. It becomes one of those things that we don't really even have to think about. Not that we don't think when we're praying, but we don't have to think about it. We do it. When we're walking down the grocery aisle and we, somebody comes to mind, you can pray for them. It doesn't mean that we have to quit our jobs and lock ourselves away in our closet and spend 10 hours a day praying. When Paul says, Devote yourselves to prayer. He's saying build it into your routine. Yes, take that time and specifically pray for certain people and situations. But also be ready to pray at any point of your day. Be ready to enter conversations at any point during the day. You're going to run into somebody and are you ready to have a conversation about Jesus with them? At any point in the day? Are you prepared to pray for somebody at any point 
in the day. It was funny, last week, uh, Bill and myself and Lonnie each ran into our friend Vince at different times during the day. And my opportunity was in the middle of the mall. And Vince was there, and I sat down to chat with him, and he said, will you pray for me? I said, here in the mall? Yeah, right now. Okay, Vince, yeah, absolutely, I'll pray for you. Are we ready? Is it built into our routine to be ready to pray for people, to talk with people, to care for people, even though it might disrupt our time and our, the task that we have to do? And Paul is saying, devote yourselves to these things. Be ready when they come about. Be ready for those conversations. May they be, he says, may they be seasoned with salt. Now, I, I love a little bit of salt. But you know that too much salt is bad for you. Uh, but it's, it's, bad to, it's, it's bad taste, too. So too little salt is bad because it doesn't taste. And too much is too bad because it's not healthy for you. And it just overpowers the piece of meat that you would like to eat or whatever it is. Now, in the early church, in the first century, salt was used to preserve meat. That was the only way that you were, that it was going to make it through to dinner was salt. And Paul is saying, preserve your conversation. Be ready to give an answer. Be willing to share what's going on in your life. Not too little, like you don't care and you blow somebody off, and not too much. That the only thing you're talking about is yourself. That it's the right amount of salt to carry on a conversation and care for somebody and pray for somebody. Do you ever think about how you respond to emails or phone calls or how you write letters? To, well, not that we write letters, but we write emails that are letters sometimes. How our conversations go. Do you ever sit at home at the end of your day and think, how much of the conversations that I had, phone calls, emails, were about me? And how much were about the person that I was interacting with? Think about that. At the end of your day today, think about all the conversations you have, and think about how much of it was I talking about myself? And how much, was, how much of it was I asking about somebody else? And Paul, Paul doesn't go to any of his own details. He says that when those guys come to Colossae, they'll inform you about my own situation. It's important, but it's not the most important. And they'll inform you. But let's keep the main thing the main thing, and that's Jesus. And let's focus on that. So Paul has asked this young church to pray for him in the ministry that he's about, that he will be effective and dynamic, and that he will be of service no matter where he's at, whether that's in prison, when he ministers to the guards and to the other inmates, whether that's a, as a free person traveling about doing ministry. And then Paul goes into this long conversation about all the other people that are traveling with him and doing ministry with him. And I didn't really pay much attention to this until this last week. And I looked at all the people. Obviously, one of those is Onesimus. Onesimus was a runaway slave that had become a believer. And Paul connected with him. And Paul sends him back to Colossae, to his owner, his master, and says, go and be a servant again. Go back to your home. And, of course, Philemon, the book of Philemon is all about that encounter and then you've got other people. You've got other people that are Jews. You've got other people that are, that are imprisoned with Paul. You've got this diverse group of people. You've got Mark. And we know from the book of Acts that Mark and Paul at some point didn't get along and they went their separate ways. But at this point, Mark and Paul are still doing ministry together. And he says, pray for all these people. Look at all these diverse people that are doing ministry for the gospel. Which I think is encouraging for us. Because the church should be diverse. A diverse group of people doing ministry together. 
focused on the ministry of Jesus and what he has done in our life. And that we should be devoted to praying for each other and for the work of the gospel. What does your prayer life look like? How do you pray each day? Sometimes our prayer life can become so routine, we pray the same words each and every day. We pray the same way each and every day. So much so that we don't even think about what we're saying. I don't think that's what Paul is asking us to do, but he is asking us to be thinking about how we're praying, what we're praying for, who we're praying for. How do you pray for the church, for leadership? How do you pray for your friends that don't know Jesus yet? How do you pray for your family? How do you pray for those people that are unwell? Think about how we do it, what we say, because it matters. And then be willing to change it. Change how you pray. Change the words that you use. Change the way that you spend your time in prayer. Don't stop praying. But think about it. Be intentional about it. 